Happy Friday, guys, and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Dubs. I'm your host, Bill T. It's Friday. You know what that means. A new podcast by Let's Talk Dubs. And today, a roundtable. But before we get into that, let's make sure we support the sponsors that support Let's Talk Dubs. VW Trends Magazine, a magazine for the people, by the people. Go subscribe to get the latest issue today at vwtrendsmagazine.com. And you can see my pretty face in the front of the magazine. So check them out today and go subscribe. Support the VW scene. Ross Wolf, high quality aftermarket parts built for enthusiasts by enthusiasts. So if you want some cool gear, go check out rosswolf.com and pick up some jewelry for your Volkswagen. Some pretty sweet parts and pieces and even mechanical pieces you need. Is your bush dash all hamburgered up? Well, Ross Wolf makes a plate that covers that big nasty hole and looks like it was meant to be. So for an inexpensive fix, and if you ain't got a welder, go to Ross Wolf today and find one of their dash hole repair kits. Don't be a dash hole. Go get the kit. Also, get your shift together and go get you one of those billet shift rod couplers today at RossWolf.com. If you got wonky, janky, bust deck lid hinges, Ross Wolf's got the answer for you. They've got stainless steel 304 deck lid hinges to replace those busted up, worn out steel hinges that are all wobbly. So go get yourself some deck lid hinges for the back of your bus at Ross Wolf today. Purveyors of speed and style for your air-cooled VW. Go to RossWolf.com today. Some of you guys love it. Some of you guys hate it. Few of you hate it. Most of you love it. But today we're doing a round table. We have George T in the studio. So let's get into this podcast. A lot of subjects to talk about. We're going to talk about some Listener emails, we're going to talk about some things going on in the VWC scene and talk about a lot of project updates and things of that nature. So without any further ado, guys, let's get into a roundtable on Let's Talk Dubs. You probably don't know that there's a new Volkswagen out that doesn't look like a Volkswagen. George T. Bill T. What up? What up? All right, man. Uh, lots to talk about. Since you just talked about the sponsor, shout out to Ross Wolf. They sent me the first Ross Wolf sand seal pulley. The first ever? First ever. The first. First. Uh, first. <laughs> bro, membership has its perks. What's that membership of? That's a membership of the Let's Talk Dubs crew, bro. That's Listen, it. not a lot of people. Very few enter. Very few leave. Jump in. Blood in, blood out. That's the way it's going to go down. So. <clears throat> lots going on uh with a ton of ton of stuff to talk about george um i think well so we're going to talk about a lot of different subjects and one of them we're going to go over some viewer email if i get a chance to find it and then uh i think what we're going to talk about first and foremost is your youtube channel that you've been working on you've mm -hmm. been putting out that uh we we're just talking about the fat stacks that you're making off of that youtube channel and uh you might be able to get yourself like a like a color coordinated jumpsuit. Sneakers, I might, maybe at the dollar store. I might be able to buy a lapel mic. Yeah, bro, <laughs> lapel mic's right there, dude. I got it all right here. It might have been from Fry's before they went out of business, but might what have can been. You do? What can you do? Yeah, the channel's going good. I apologize, everybody, last week for not putting a uh, video out, but bro, slacker. Yeah, unfortunately, sometimes when you're dealing with cars, they don't want to cooperate. <laughs> Why what happened last week? So what was the what was the issue last week? So I was trying to make a video of sinking carbs, mm -hmm. and when I actually fired up that that same bus you saw me do the Gene Berg linkage on, if you watch my channel, mm -hmm. I also had to change the base gaskets. Uh, they were both blown out, big huge holes blown out in each one. When I fixed the base gaskets and I put everything back together, the car wouldn't idle below seventeen hundred, even with the back the screws completely backed out, completely taken out of the carburetors. So. After messing with it for like an hour and a half, not being able to figure it out, I called my sensei, Russ, up. By the way, great podcast with Russ from Old Speed. That was yeah. one of my favorites so far. But I called Russ up, and I'm explaining what happened. And they said, take him off. Go into the bathroom with a flashlight. Whoa, this is getting weird, bro. <laughs> That's what he said that. I said, oh, it's getting interesting. <laughs> he said, you shine it up from the throat and look at the way the uh, the plates are. And he was correct. They were way out of whack. Like, you could see solid light all the way around them. So you have to loosen up the butterflies and adjust them. So it just turned into a whole hairball. So it, I had an entire day wasted. Let's expose of our mushroom heads to each Don't other. Don't do it. <laughs> so basically, I don't like it. That's, 
<laughs> My brother's got issues. <laughs> got problems. Well, he, told you, he told you to go into the bathroom with the carburetors. So it just made me think of uh, my friend, <laughs> my friend with this guy. So I don't know if you guys like the rest of us idiots, but we, uh, well, I mostly, I send 10 to 1 Instagrams to all these guys, these ridiculous memes, because I don't know if these guys are working or what, but I send 10 to 1 because I just find funny stuff on here. And there's one that's not Will Blunderfield. And this guy's a, um, he's a, a double, double shaman, something or other. Anyway, strange cat, but, uh, you know, hey man, to each their own. But yeah, it's pretty funny. So when you said that, hmm. it just made me think of that. So you you went. What's funny is Russ was telling me. Act just pulling back. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Russ was telling me that is the first time. First time he had to do it. Uh, Roland is that his buddy's yep, name? Roland. Yep, yep. He said Roland was showing him how to do it. So then when someone showed up, it's him and Roland walking out of the bathroom together. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and then having to explain like, oh, we're working on a carburetor. Yeah, sure, you sure you are. Sure uh, you are. Sure you are. All right. So you ended up, the. how did the butterflies get out of whack? It's a good question. You know, this thing had an idling issue when I started it. I could not get to idle below 1,200 RPM. Mm-hmm. I mean, completely take off the linkage and the things backed off. And then when I fixed the intake leaks at the base gaskets, I think what happened was then it, then it corrected that air leak. So when the, the idle just came up, I don't know how they came out of adjustment. It's kind of, it's kind of weird. But I did some tinkering with them. You sit there with a flashlight underneath it, and you're shining it through with the butterflies loose, and you just kind of snap them back a couple of times, and all of a sudden you see them self-center, and the light almost disappears. Tighten it down, and then when I put them back on the car, we had a great idle. But by that time, I was knee-deep into 10 other things, so unfortunately didn't get a video out last week. Well, it, these things happen in the big business of uh, media production. so It's going to affect my pay. <laughs> yeah, listen, bro, you might uh, you could be on the street, bro. I tell you, you know, going through some of your, I don't know if the rest of you guys, any of you guys have this, uh, you're getting this message, but I got this message from uh, a name that I can't pronounce, and it says, uh, your Facebook page is expected to be permanently removed due to posts that, v- that violates trademark rights. Yeah, there's a bunch of spam going around that you keep getting on the uh, on the Instagram, and the, and not Instagram, but on Facebook, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's... Uh, a lot of a lot of chaos out there. So if you I get, get one of those things, if you get one of those things all the times, just delete them. Don't even waste your time replying to them because it'll have a link and use the link. Those are phishing ones. So if some of you guys out there are a little older. Well, I get the guys who apparently look at my Instagram feed and go, "You'd be perfect ambassador for our product of jewelry no. and watches." And I go, "Oh, am yeah, I?" <laughs> I've had that too. Well, I have one here. This is from Sarah Harrison. She says, "Hi there. Really like the work you're doing as a podcaster. Kudos to you." Hmm. We're Kudos. helping podcasters grow their personal brand by using our video editing and viral hook scripts in the next 30 to 90 days worth of conversation. Are you guys ready to get hooked? Question mark. Best regards, Sarah Harrison. Let's take a little look at Sarah's page here. You know how I feel about all this malarkey, dude. What's that? El natural, dude. Organic. Yeah, there's a le- there's or a yeah, but there's organic. a there's a level of organic and then there's a level of self promotion that is organic where you can go to some of the pages that you view where you can post your own stuff to get more traffic because there's no value in a really good YouTube page that nobody knows about. So you sometimes have to self promote some of your own stuff and uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't, I don't but see here's that the thing. as not being organic. I don't visit those other pages regularly. So all I would be doing was would be going to those pages and putting posts up about my videos. So it would not be authentic to go onto their pages. So uh, I promote on my Facebook, I promote on my Instagram, Usually when I put those posts up, I see there's about four or five people who regularly share them for me, which I'm always thankful. Thank you, to, thank you to everybody who shares any of my links or videos or any of that stuff, and it's always appreciated. Yeah. <clears throat> well, um, there's interesting. Uh, you know, I, I get a lot of me- a lot of messages from people, and um, a lot of people that have suggestions for topics and things like that. And some people give me suggestions for topics, and then I may or may not reach back out to them, whatever, and then they'll start their own podcast. And so it's, it's happened. Um, but there, there's there's people out there starting, and, and I think there's nothing wrong with somebody starting a mm-hmm. podcast. I think if you come up with original content, do your own thing. I think that's great. I think, um, you know, there's, I was just saying today that 
the VW scene is, is massive. It's worldwide. It's such a huge scene. And part of, part of my issue sometimes, um, some of the guys in Southern California, they think that's the only place where the scene exists. And the thing that I take issue with that is, is it gets, it gets a little bit old when it's the same guys featuring each other on their different platforms instead of reaching out to like people that are not from Southern California, people that are doing big things and cool things in other, other markets and other areas. Mm -hmm. And I I think what happens is they get so drunk on their own Kool-Aid or maybe, maybe they're super fans of the hobby themselves and interview, uh, interview some people. I mean, I just have to give honest feedback. Um, I saw the video that Stefan did this week and it was done by Eddie Collins and Eddie Collins produces a bunch of stuff for hot VWs and whatnot. So he's got a skill set to do, you know, video, some video content creation. Mm -hmm. My biggest issue with that video was it, the audio was just, he, he need, he needed to have him mic'd up because taping it outside audio to distance, crossbreed stuff like that makes it difficult to get stuff. To. You learn as you do the channel. I, I, some I of mine's at, trash yeah, in the first videos. I'll, I'll look at everybody's stuff and, and take a look at it. And then I saw the stuff that Ron and Amber were doing their podcast. They do. And the first, I think they have four, six episodes out now. I don't know. Where are we at? Um, what number are we on? Well, uh, this is episode 261. 261. So <clears throat> consistency is key. So, well, but the, but the, the problem was the issue that I see with the one that they were doing is they were, they're, they're trying to do, Facebook live and something else. And their microphones weren't plugged in to an audio interface that was pushing into uh, a software that would put it out through that. Like with my system that I use, it'll put a, pull it out. We'll probably do a, a Facebook live stream sometime in the near future. I think, or YouTube, it'll be pretty fun. Um, I'd like to do it maybe down at the shop and we'll just kind of do some things and set something up for a night just to, just to do something, test the stream and talk to your followers, my followers, both on Instagram. If we can get a couple thousand people watching it, that'd be pretty fun to do. I mean, the odds are it'd be a couple hundred. We'd be lucky, you mm-hmm. know, because people don't really jump, Maybe 30. On, jump on live stream, <clears throat> stuff like that. I don't. <laughs> but it depends. It depends on what, what they're doing. So uh, we probably will have an announcement to make soon that I think will be worthy of doing a live stream. But part of my thing is getting back to the subject is – the scene is bigger than Southern California. And when your focus is just Southern California, I think to people that are outside of Southern California, it's kind of a turnoff because you're like, well, yeah, I've read 46 articles on the guy. I know everything about the guy. That's great. But can I see something else, something different, something, um, something that's got a little change of tempo because it's cool. It's their thing, but it's like, that's, it seems like it's the only thing that they do is like, cow look that's mm-hmm. it that's the only thing that, that that they do it's the only thing that's on their register and the the hobby is so much more diverse than that but again that's why i'm here right because i interview guys from all over everywhere and every different style from owner builders to I, i've got from alex balgen to buddy hale so alex balgen built his car in his garage him and his dad buddy hale built turmoil him and his team type one restoration pushing the envelope way past the point of and not at a SoCal. Well, yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, I'll talk about that for a minute, right? So <clears throat> here you have a car that's being built to an incredible level. And if you if you appreciate cars, I think you'll look at it and think, I can't believe the incredible amount of work that they're doing. Most people, <clears throat> most people have a, some bone to pick where they look at it and say, oh, yeah, it must be nice just to have money and do this and do that. And I think a lot of that kind of talk all comes comes from like jealousy or um, not appreciating the hobby. And those might be the same people that think there's only one style. It's only this way or no way. And they don't appreciate the hobby getting elevated. And what I mean by elevated is like push to new levels. You know, buddies out there at all the good guy shows, all these things competing against these massive cars. Non-VW shows. And getting respect, and even the, yeah. the, the better thing with that, <clears throat> how many how many people go to these shows like Good Guy shows or Grand National Road show, and they'll see a car, 
they'll get inspired. They'll go home and build it, but they're never going to build it to the level they saw at the Grand National Roadster Show. But it's something they saw that motivated them. And so I think when you when you have guys like Buddy out there showing their cars at other than VW events, and these are high caliber cars that are built on part of these mega cars that these other top hot rod shops are building. I think when you're doing stuff like that, I think you're getting other people that are crossing over to the VW scene. I was just talking today. We had a visit from uh, Rob and Mike and Icy from uh, Impy. They came down. They were in Vegas making some rounds there. They stopped by Georgia shop. We chatted for a little bit and we talked about marketing. And one of my frustrations is that it seems like the VW world only talks to the VW world and there's very little crossover, you know, and they're like in their own bubble. And I said, I have my favorite, my favorite experiences when I'm not at VW shows from interacting with bystanders, people that walk by <clears throat> the one VW show that I did have a great time at I'm not saying I didn't have a great time, but the one, let me rephrase that. The one, the one VW show where I had really good interaction with bystanders, bystanders was the Huntington beach pier show. And plus where my bus was down in the big corral right by the curb mm -hmm. in Huntington Beach where everybody's walking by. Lots of people coming by, lots of people complimenting the bus, lots of people talking about the bus, lots of people asking questions. And you don't get that at a VW show. You'll rarely get that. But for the most part... It's captive audience. It's like people who are in the scene. That when you're at that peer show, you're getting a lot of uh, like John Q. Public just walking by. So yeah. that's why a lot of that interaction probably took place there. Well, again, that's the not reason. Not too many spectators come into a VW show, but not spectators VW people. But spectators are not. What I'm saying is like when you go to a hot rod show, I get tons of people coming to talk to me about my Volkswagen. Yeah, because you're at a hot rod show. Because it's something diff it's different. Maybe it's just a different vibe at a hot rod show that people walk around. and. Well, that's, I'll just say my favorite VW show experience has to be <clears> when we went up north with George and John and all them and went to the races. North where? Of Norse for the races, uh, on an island. Met. Oh, you're talking about uh, not Medford. It was. Uh, it wasn't Medford. We we're still in California, but it's right on the border. Yeah, Dang yeah. it! It's uh, Eureka up there in Eureka. It was the it was the uh, the summer the summer slam. But that was probably my favorite VW event I've been to in a very long time. What was more like a lot of people hanging out, a lot of conversation, a lot of camaraderie, not a lot of. Jealousy or I mean, although they were racing it wasn't like it was jealousy and racing. It was mm -hmm. just like this big vibe But I think a lot of that has to do with uh, With like all the food the community the candy kitchen. Yeah, yeah, the candy kitchen and all that kind of stuff and John with his pig John Yeah, John Limnios my brother Greek up there in the bay G down shout out for him, <laughs> man He's uh, he got his car put together. Yes, and he, he was did. out there running at um, running there at uh, the bug drag right? day drag day just recently yeah. and I went out to support my dog because he's OG listener from the mm -hmm. way back. And he got, and you know, here's what, here's the, here's what happens guys. When you're an OG listener from the way back, when you're down with the let's talk dubs, you get hooked up, bro. And he got hooked up with some memorabilia. That's uh one of eight. I think it is one of eight sets of the glass from the casino. From the oh, nice. One there crazy you go. Weekend. There you go. So went down there, hooked him well up. Well deserving. And because he's an electrician, I said, I'm expecting you to do big things with this. Okay. <laughs> so don't let me down. <laughs> But, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, that, that's what the hobby's all about. The hobby's about, like, he's he's really, he's into racing way more than I am, but he appreciates other stuff. Everybody appreciates stuff. And he's a lot of the reason that you took your drag car down the track. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You no, know, he, like, I still got his seatbelt. So one belt. hand washes the other. I still got he, he, his seatbelt in, in the Red Dragon. Yeah. So... <laughs> I don't know if you guys are ready for the red dragon. Flames out of that dude. Unleashed. <laughs> hey, watch, watch your mouth. So at any rate, I, I enjoy, I love this hobby more than this. That's the reason I do this podcast. This is beyond a hobby in our lives. Yeah. It, it really is. It is. It, it, this it, has literally been our lifestyles. Yeah. Since we were teenagers, it's been VWs. No, it has. Cause that's what broke kids drive is VWs. Yeah. Cause get a Ford mini truck. <laughs> Pretty much. And, uh, it's it's definitely it, it's something I hold dear, and I kind of it it kind of bugs me when I see people, um, what do they call it? What's the word I'm thinking of? Gatekeep. You know what yeah. I mean? Yep. Like when I when I see people, what what really bums me out the most when I see somebody that built a car, put a ton of hard work into it, shows up at an event, and everybody's like, Psh, "Look at that thing, bro! This guy, 
he went a little too much of this or a little too much of that versus just like, Hey man, dig the car. I can, I can tell you put a lot of work into it yeah. and the hobby more people. If, if you look at somebody's car and the first thing is like, that's lame. Look at this. Let's maybe you need to look in the mirror and be like, uh, um, <laughs> distracted. Come on. So I'm not distracted, bro. I got a text message. Back up, back up. We, we all heard the ding. Back bro. up, Terry. So <laughs> train of thought lost. No. And where was I? I got a train left the building is what happened. Well, were you listening? You were you listening? What's that? Were you listening to what I said? You were talking about the gatekeeping yeah, and people so going to shows. My point and, was Yeah, let's get to if the point. you're the guy that looks at someone's car and you instantly have fifty opinions, you need to turn around, you need to go look in the mirror and say, like, listen, this hobby is to build up cars and do stuff like What's my nickname, bro? George Judgy George. There you go. So <laughs> I'm the guy you don't want to be around. <laughs> Yeah, but, but I, I mean, also keep my opinion to myself. I, I don't go up and talk to people. Your car is crap. You know? Yeah, I don't know, man. I just, I, I love, I love the different people that are in the hobby because they do different things. I, it might not be my style, but if somebody's committed and does something cool, man, I appreciate it. And and I like nothing more than giving somebody a compliment, like, hey, man, that's cool. That's that's pretty cool. I like how you did this. You know. Mm -hmm. So maybe next time you're looking at somebody's car, maybe you might want to. Give them a compliment. Find something you like about it and say, hey, man, I like this. You know, I saw there's a, a gal building her bug on Instagram, Ann's VW. I Annie's. Think Annie's VW. And I reached out to her and said, hey, you want to come on the podcast? Now, she'd be the first woman I've had on the podcast. And um, I reached out to her and I suggested, hey, come on the podcast. And I started reading some of her stuff. And, of course, everybody's got something to say with anything she's working on. And, you know, she's in her garage, uh, Annie's underscore VW, and she's got a ton of followers, you know, and she's building, she's doing a 69 Beetle and she's in Alberta, Canada, and she's doing her own thing. And I think it's super cool. And, but that's the internet, right? You start doing something, everybody's like, oh, you're doing that wrong. You should do this like that. And I get should. comments on my videos where people tell me how I should be doing things. Yeah. That doesn't bother me. Well, but what I'm saying is like... I'm also thick-skinned. I see she puts up at it very well. Like, she'll comment on it. Like, I'm getting responses about this or that, you know? And, like, right. today's was about dynamating, kill mat, whatever the hell right, she's right. using. Well, that's know. the one that I saw today, and I just thought, like... But... You when know, you put yourself out there, you're putting yourself... You're exposing yourself to that kind of feedback. Yeah, So, yeah. I mean, it, when I started making videos... Before I launched my very first video, all I thought about all I thought about was the negative backlash coming back, as opposed to like, well, someone might be able to use this for a positive. And surprisingly, I've had minimal negative backlash on my videos, I where I was expecting feedback, not backlash, the opposite. Right. I was expecting people to like, oh, I do it this way, and you're doing it wrong, and blah blah blah. You know. Yeah, people are just people. Sometimes, sometimes it's what make the hobby. You put for yourself the out there. It's going to be expected. You're no, going to no, get, no, no. You're Listen, going to get some no, negative no question, reactions no from question. people. I've had people. There's a couple people left a one-star review on one, Lone Less Talk Dubs. And if I find them, let's take it to the Take you out. Take it to the streets, player. Keep that same energy. You can't say nothing nice. Don't say nothing. Don't leave a review. <laughs> but it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's. But we've been accused of gatekeeping in the Las Vegas scene. You're a gatekeeper, bro. You know, like just the fact like. We're original members of Las Vegas Volkswagen Club. Yep. Started it the very first meeting and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And we started that when we were children. You know, all the guys that were in that club, maybe the oldest guy was Noah at the time. Noah's always been the oldest dude around mm -hmm. us. But, I mean, we were in our very early 20s, if not even possibly I might have still been 19. Mm. I think I was 20 by then. I know I wasn't legal to drink, though, but I was 20. I but we were kids. But do so you we need grow to be, up with do you these. Need to be legal to drink Zima. <laughs> so we grow up as a group, and then flash forward 15, 20 years later, and people are like, "Well, you know, you guys don't let people in." Well, it's not the fact that we don't let people in; it's the fact that we've all been around each other since we were kids. You know, well, a good okay. chunk of us. Well, have let been around me together. let me clarify a little bit of that. If you're coming into the scene and you're like, "Hey, man, I want to be part of a club," usually clubs have consistent meeting points mm -hmm. and they have consistent events and they have a lot of consistency because someone who's more energetic than others is involved in coordinating, scheduling and putting things together for people. And I think what happens with a club that's been together for a long time, it kind of ends up being like the guys that are involved 
are doing are, are doing things eventually and it's not like we're in this big hurry to go do stuff because mm-hmm. it's like it's on autopilot. Yeah. It, Nobody it, puts any effort <clears throat> into the club, but the club still exists. Well, you know, yeah. and that's fine by me. I don't want a club where there's like monthly dues and meetings every, you know, I don't want to be in a club well, like that. Again, I got enough stuff in my life. I don't need some, to have nothing to mix. Some people are like that. And I think during the original <clears> days <throat> of the Las Vegas Folkestone Club, when we were organizing the club, the whole purpose of the club was when we go to California for us to show together, be together and mm-hmm. represent Las Vegas. That's it. So mission I think, accomplished. Yeah. I think that's part of the whole club thing, but, uh, I'm, uh, George. So that, that was in relate. That was in, in response to your gatekeeper comment. You know, we, we, I think anybody can kind of be accused of it. If you're uh, an old head in the scene, if you've been around in that scene for a while, anybody can be accused of gatekeeping, you know, my, yeah. Just my opinion, I'm going to say. Let me clarify that. But that's my opinion. Yeah. Because yeah. I think outsiders look at it differently. If everybody who asked to be in Las Vegas Volkswagen Club was in it, we'd be hundreds of members of people who don't own Volkswagens anymore. You know? Well, they like came in and they don't even own the car anymore. That's sometimes part of the issue, right? Like, you can tell people, when someone's not a people, lifer. But people, but people get into a club, and then you get a guy in a club, and he's all fired up, and then he wants to get everything going. Next thing you know, he tries to take over the club or tries to just just run it a different way than it's been run. And sometimes the club originated with a bunch of people that used to – I don't want to say I started it, but I probably started it hanging out at DRP because I met Jim, and then I started going there all the time. Then you got a job there. Mm-hmm. But like when I, I was first over there when Jim – I dropped the – the velocity stack bolt down my carburetor and he Jim pulled the head off my car, showed me what I did and then kind of helped me put it back together. And then from that point forward, I just started to come by visit. Carrie was super nice to me. Mm-hmm. Then I brought you around and I think you started working there, right? Yeah, I you, worked, I you worked started, for Carrie doing upholstery, yeah, like helping her assemble cars. Yeah. You started working there, helping her out. But then it became like over time, it became the hangout, like four o'clock every oh, day. Yeah. Everybody, was everybody there. was at DRP. You know what I mean? And it just and before our time there, Carlos was there, so a lot of the guys from the other club circle used to hang out there because Carlos was there, Larry West was there. Uh, I don't you know, know if they hung out there so much because Jim wasn't a very friendly dude to those guys. No. Jim was, yeah, but Carlos worked there, so I think they'd probably go hang out. With no, Carlos, I get it, you know? but again, Carlos wasn't a real chatty kind of dude, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, so what I'm saying is like when it came to hanging out, like it changed when we started hanging out there, like the whole core of us, like you, me, Sean, um. You know, Andy was there all the time. Andy I mean, Bullock, yeah. yeah, there was there was just a, there was just a group of people that were always there. Mark D, Mark D would come by. The guy that's mm-hmm. never been to more VW shops and never had one. <laughs> he had one, but then we started chocolate getting drop. We yeah, chocolate drop. You guys want to remember that from? I think it was like ninety seven. He was in the magazine and uh, VW Trans. It was on the engine builders uh, special when you went inside there. Well, they the whole point of of the conversation there is. We were a club, right? Vegas, Vegas Volks. Volks, straight up. And then there was another which club was in town called Slow and Low before Vegas Volks. I don't consider that club. We never had a logo. Vegas we Volks had too. logos on our car. Bro, don't get mad. No, come on now. They're not Slow and Low. Never saw a logo once. But Vegas Volks, we used to rock Vegas Volks logos on ours. Mm-hmm. And then there was another club in town called Precious Metals. Yeah. And <clears throat> actually, rephrase that. At that time, Precious Metals had disbanded, and there was a Diluft Coolin Club. That had started, mm. and that didn't it. It didn't really gain speed of momentum, but that is where the Las Vegas Volkswagen Club logo came from because Jerry Casey designed that logo right. for Derek when he when he started Diluf Coolin, and then we had the meeting at DRP where Volksworld or Vegas Volks and Diluf Coolin became one to be all the clubs in Vegas. Yeah, and, and that's th- how I recall I, it. And I think it was spearheaded by Carrie. Yeah, for sure. She was wanting to. And Derek Campbell. He was. He. Re, he. I'd say he had a big part of it too. I think we all did. I think it was a group. But I'm heard. saying like Carrie wanted wanted to try to get everybody together, and uh, at any rate, it doesn't even matter at this point. Yeah. It's that was in '93. That club was put together ninety three, ninety seven. It was uh, actually ninety seven is the established, mm. like when it was actually became legitimate when we got permission from Volkswagen to use the word Las Vegas Volkswagen Club. Um, 
Yeah, I know. We we started it in in '96, though. I'm gonna say yeah, is when we all started hanging out together. No, it was more than that because it was '93 when my when my bug was at DRP when it was painted silver and it had the ten four. And the very the first Vegas, bug in that Vegas that DRP did was in '94. But I don't think we were Las Vegas Volkswagen Club at that time. At least there wasn't a logo on that flyer at that time. Yeah. And in the '97 show that Kerry put on, the Las Vegas Volkswagen Club logo is on that. So poster. that brings us to talk about a lot of things that are kind of connected with that. So we talked about the, uh, Mark D with the engine building uh, deal is the cover of VW Trends. The Chocolate last time, drop. The last time they did the big engine builders build off. Mm-hmm. And Impy is doing one now again this year. And that's one of the things we talked to Rob about. That's about so, a right turn segue if I ever no, saw. It's not a right turn segue, <laughs> knucklehead. <laughs> Bro. No, we're talking about we're talking about right. shows and events. You said the off. first show that Carrie did. So I'm tied all together. So just settle mm-hmm. down. So the the got the MP build off, which we tie back to our boy Mark D, whose bug chocolate drop was in that issue of VW Trends. But they're doing MP's doing the engine build off, and with that engine build off, they're given like I don't know what they said, like twenty thousand dollars. Or something like that, and are they donating all the parts to build the engines? No, so the, or you so gotta the build rule, your own motor? The, the rule is you got to build your own motor. Um, you build your own motor, and then you get to see. There, June fifteenth, uh, SoCal Bug Week, whatever it's going to be called, they're going to have um, the engine dyno set up over there. And they're going to be dynamo in people's engines and people. So they're they're like I guess the rule is you can build it. It's got to be MP parts. You build it. Whoever's going to have the most horsepower is going to win some dinero. And I'll find out if I can. Now I got to figure out what. But it's going to be the fifteenth of June. It's going to be taking place at MP's open house. And there's people from all over the country that are building engines that are going to bring it to it. So you get your car there, or you get your engine there for the dyno pull, all that stuff. Then the winner, uh, winner gets paid out. And I'm going to get all the details on that in a second. But one of the things that made me think of when you said the first event that we did, that Carrie put on at the Las Carrie Vegas. Barbo. That was at the Las Vegas Motor Speedway. Before it was Las Vegas place. Motor Speedway. I think no, it was just called Las it Vegas. It is the Las Vegas Motor Speedway right here in the poster that I have right yeah, here. Yeah, but that's not the first one. This is the 1997 show. Is what I'm yeah, saying. 94 was the first one. My the point bugger. I'm bringing up that you're just keep, you keep ruining the, you're ruining the segue. You're like stomping out this fire I'm trying to start. Uh-huh. I'm over here with the kindling and the coconut shells uh-huh. just trying to get a fire and you just keep blowing it out. So there's a, supposed to be the big event coming up in October that uh, Corey Mack and those guys are putting on. Uh-huh. Brian Watts and I have been in a little bit of communication. I haven't seen anything. They tell, they say it's a go, but uh, other than the official announcement, I haven't seen anything out. But that ties it together because our first show we put at the Speedway, now the new show that's going to be at the Speedway, my understanding about the Las Vegas Motor Speedway, is it is not cheap to mm-hmm. rent. It's like not at all. 30 Gs to rent it. And uh, <clears throat> the problem is, I don't want to say VW people are cheap, but they don't want to spend. But 20, are you going to get that kind of uh, participation to? Uh, uh, that is such a big nut bro. to crack. At a car show, if you do twenty bucks a car and you usually get two hundred cars, you ain't cracking a twenty five thousand dollar bill on that. And then the racers have prize money to go with it. Yeah. And well, how, how be... much are spectators going to pay to walk into the gate? What well, no matter and how what, many spectators are you going to get? There that was just a insane. show. There was just a show over there that took place for three days and it was at Muscle Cars at the Strip and it was mm-hmm. $30 a day to get in. Jeez. To get in to walk the oh, show. Was it Grand National Road Show? <laughs> well, the the bigger problem, the bigger problem was you have to put you got to put ten miles on your legs just walking around because there's fifty acres out there and everything's spread out and, yeah. and everything's ten miles from everything else. But so this event's supposed to be happening December fifth, I think it is, and uh, December fifth or seventh. I'm not really sure. Well, we know, we went to the Las Vegas Motor Speedway uh, website and they don't have anything listed for it on that date, which was odd. I thought. Yeah, so it's supposed to be December seventh, which yeah, is going to be the first. <clears throat> Uh, it's going to be on uh, odd month too to do a show considering like December, you know, you just passed Thanksgiving. People are gearing up for Christmas shopping and whatnot. I don't know. That seems odd. 
Well, we'll see. I, we listen, will support it. I'm going to tell you that. I'm uh, hoping so, uh, the Las Vegas Volkswagen Club, Bill, all of us, we're going to be out there 100%. and participate 100%. I had some people reach out to me on Facebook and said, hey, man, if this thing's going on, what's going on that weekend? And I said, well, Steve Richardson is going to do something for Cow Look people. <laughs> And he's gonna. We'll do an open house of the wagon. He's gonna make his brisket, and we'll make. We'll do an open house I, and, of the and wagon. And what I said is, I said I'm sure as things start to come together and things are solidified, mm -hmm. we'll have something taking place over at the wagon. I'm sure. You yeah. Know what I mean, for so, sure. Uh, waiting to see what transpires. I know Brian reached out to me this week, and uh, we haven't been able to connect yet. But hopefully, we want nothing more but good shows in Las Vegas. We want yeah. we want Vegas to be a Volkswagen destination. Well, between one crazy weekend in October. And if this show actually does take off and they get their thing going in December, I'm all for it. Yeah, the 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 bigger thing is Vegas is a natural hub yeah. for Phoenix, Sacramento, California, Los Angeles. It's Denver, a destination location. Utah. No, no, no. But the the major cities around here are Phoenix, Albuquerque, uh, Denver. Um, you've got uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, you got Sacramento, you got Reno, you got, you got all these areas where it's kind of a hub around all these. It's way cheaper to stay here. But as of right now, I don't think they have a host hotel. They're trying to, I guess they're trying to hammer out all the details, but I'll get more. The more info I get on that, the more I'll pass on to you guys. Cause yeah. I love seeing, uh, lots of VWs in my city. So we'll, uh, we'll pass on that information when we get it. But that, that tied those two things together. So June 15th, we're going to be down there at the, uh, MP open house and hopefully I'll have my MP GTV bug there. So that's the bug that's in that uh, Mike Mays is working on. And Mike's got a little YouTube channel he's putting together. He's going to start putting some videos out. We're going to do some collaborations on a couple of videos of the, of the preservation of the 70 GTV bug that I picked up from him. He swapped out the rockers and MP is going to be connecting us with some parts to get that thing going. So hopefully We'll get that stuff shipped out this week to Mike so he can get cracking on that thing. And if uh, we're lucky enough, maybe Mike will drive that thing out to the east, to the west coast if uh, if I don't want to do it. So, or if he's able to do it, that would be, that would save me a lot because June 15th is that event. Then I fly out on the 17th. I fly out to the UK for the Cal Look crews, pick up the Type 34 and then go on to that. So how long are you be there? I will be there for two weeks. Okay. So I'll be there half the week before the weekend of Bad Camberg. Then we're all going to drive to Bad Camberg. Then the week in between, we're going to go to the Carmen Museum and then the, Volks, the Volkswagen Museum. Then we'll end up the following weekend at um, European Bug Inn in Belgium. And then after European Bug Inn, drive back on Monday to um, to England. And from there, fly home on Tuesday. So that's currently that's the plan. So I got I got a busy summer plus we'll be moving shops at that time. So that's going to be going to be a lot of action packed stuff going on. Yeah. But I'm looking forward to it. So um what are you working on at the shop? What's new and exciting down there that uh any 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 projects coming close to fruition or some major milestones that are hitting or anything? Uh when and had paint mix this week. Yeah. Which is actually a pretty major milestone. Because once you're getting paint mixed, because now the car's ready to shoot. <clears throat> uh, 67 Titian Red Deluxe 21 window. Pretty yeah. slick ride. Actually really, really stoked that we're mixing up the paint right now. Like that's when stuff starts to become a reality. I actually did my spray out samples this week. Because you give the guys a, a code, so it's L555 is for the Titian Red. And you give them that code and yeah my computer has it in it and then they mix it up and then you got to get it to where it's supposed to be and luckily i'd already had a color mixed up previous to it that i liked and so i did my spray outs i sprayed the color i liked and i took it back to my paint mixer and said you got to match this one for me because it looks so much better than what it, the stuff he makes me was like red red like lipstick red and titian red's a very dark brick brown red i would call it yeah, so that's a big that's a big milestone for that one. And you just finished doing a massive wiring job on a seventy what? It's a seventy one bay window that we just did the full wiring on, and also all the auxiliary wiring. I got a little video I'm putting together for that one, and it's not the specifics of a wiring job, but showing how I tackle a wire job, wiring job. Yeah, got uh, 
Jason Weiler's old double cab now owned by Eric Black. We just did a bunch of revamps on that one on the electrical system and whatnot and put burg linkage on it. I'm always busy. I'm always pumping stuff out. Well, I know here at the uh, at my house I've been working on not a lot lately. I've been, I've been collecting all the pieces slowly for the vintage stereo system for the uh, chop top. Mm-hmm. I actually all sent the Fosgate out, stuff. Yeah, I actually sent out my Speedo. I had a couple extra 68 Speedos. That oh yeah, for another thing to mention is the uh, Red Barn and Kelly Park show coming up in a couple of weeks. We're gonna try to make it to that event. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, speaking of that, squirrel. last time <laughs> no, not a squirrel. I'm tying it together, knucklehead. Pay attention. Watch how the I weave last the magic. Time <laughs> we were there at the Red Barn swap meet. I bought two 1968 speedos because mm-hmm. in the chop top is a 68 speedo. What makes a spe- 68 speedo special, George? It looks early as far as the graphics of it go but it has a gas gauge on it it's Correct. the only one that looks green, like that green face. 68 would have been a black face white white letters and that's it oh, i'm sorry 69 green face gauge with the integrated gas gauge so mm-hmm. it's it's perfect for like the custom cow lookers stuff like that an oval window and the uh so when i was at octo in february ran into a guy from speedo king and hit him up and i said let me grab your information and I'll send you these Speedos. And then I boxed them up and had them sitting and sitting and sitting and sitting. And I finally walked by, grabbed the box, shipped it to him. He turned them around in about a week and a half, two weeks. He was out of some. They look nice. He was out of some parts. Completely refurbished the Speedos. They look super good. Brand new, basically. Yeah, I ended up paying about one forty-five a piece to get them. That's extremely cheap. Redone, and they they did. He did a really super nice job. So, uh, shout out to Speedo King, um, the guy hooked it up again. And I paid. He did. I you know I don't recall getting any kind of discount or anything like that. But he uh, and I wasn't trying to get one. I just wanted my Speedo done. And, and my mm-hmm. and my disposition is always like if I find something good, man, pass it on to you guys, and you guys go go handle that. So give um, Speedo King a try. <laughs> yeah, give Speedo King a shot. So I have a listener email here I wanted to read, and it's from Pierre Wessels. Pierre. Pierre says, Hi, Bill. Regular listener on Spotify. My friends and I grew up with Cow Look VWs. Perfect time to be in high school, 82 to 87, but up in Vancouver, BC. My friend Eric built a pretty cool, a pretty nice Cow Look 61 Beetle. Center lines, oval window section, graft in, velour interior, dechromed, one-piece windows, etc. After this build, he moved on to the more interesting story. He decided he wanted to build a gloss black panel pre-67. It's a pretty cool story. The bus turned out amazing, especially for being an early 90s build in his barn. Was very well known build, taking the best of show trophy at the Great Canadian VW Show. Lots of old school ingenuity, turning it into slammed and polished on alloys. Four wheel disc built motor, custom interior and stereo. Self-made narrowed front trailing arms, also to fit bigger alloys tucked underneath growing up and selling the bus was inevitable outcome but how he found it and bought it back in the u.s is where the story becomes entertaining if this is of any interest i can connect you with him thanks pierre so i thought that was a pretty cool story you know about a guy building his own his own i mean i'd like to get the story on the narrowed uh trailing arms narrowed trailing arms yeah so um I'm definitely, definitely reach out to him. I'm going to look at what I'm going to do is first look in the old issues I have of Hot VWs and see if I can find pictures of it from the Great Canadian Buggin in sometime in the 90s. And if, 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 if the, in the, if the magazines here were covering that issue, I'll be checking that out. So, uh, cool story. And it reminds me when we were first here, the first time I saw a car that had a Type 4. There was a black panel bus here in Vegas that said Irie 63 on the plates. I don't know who owned it, but it had a Type 4 in it, and it was a lowered black panel, and it was pretty fast. So I think that's uh, it's funny how those two stories come together, and that was one of the first stories I heard about a dude at a super fast bus here in Vegas back in the early 90s. So black panels must be where it's at. Matter of fact, the guy, I'm trying to think of the dude's name, Steve. I think I swear his name was Steve. And I met him at the classic when we started talking about buses before I built the bull run bus. And he's the one that talked me into doing type four. And I wish, cause he had a, he, I, I met him at, um, 
at the classic and he had a primered panel on fully polished Fuchs 16s. And we started talking, you know, of course she sees by with the bus. You're like, yeah, I got a bus I'm building right now too. And we just started talking. He says, he just kind of pitched me for the whole type four thing. And I said, I like where you're going with this. And then the rest is history. But I like I want, what you're putting down. I, I wonder, I wonder whatever happened to that guy. And if he listens to the podcast, so Steve, um, if you're out there, bro, yeah, bro, give me a shout. Secondly, like, my name is Bob, not Steve. <laughs> yeah. He's gonna come like, Hey bro, my name is, my name is Filbert. Um, the secondly, I did find my VIN number for the 63 bug that I've been looking for forever. All right. And I, and I found it, you know how I found it, hmm. <clears throat> you know, the picture, so I have a picture that we took in that bug in the early nineties when. Uh, we found some wheel adapters and we were over at Noah's house and he had some big old deep dish fuchs. Mm -hmm. And I was like, dude, I just want to see what my car looks like with fuchs on it. And they were sticking out like a, like a half an inch all the way around the fenders. And we put them on and we have that picture from his garage. Mm -hmm. And you know that I drove the car with those on there and burned up the paint on the fenders. Cause I was like, I just want to see how it drives with alloys. You know what I mean? Like it was, it was a picture moment. But when, when I had that, you remember when we went to the junkyard and we bought that 63 rag top, mm -hmm. the guy says, I can't give you a title for it. I can give you a receipt. And he wrote, VW body and pan $400. Well, on the back of that, I pulled that receipt out just looking at it the other day. It just kind of, it happened in February and uh, I had the picture here and it ended up, um, I had written down the VIN number of on that car. Yeah. I did this because I was, and you found that receipt, I was, found that receipt because it was in that picture. It was like, so sticking out the VIN. So there's a couple people reached out to me and said, Hey, if you get me the VIN number, I can find that car. So this is to my listeners that are listening. If you guys have access to where you can track this street car team, down, get street to team. it. <laughs> listen up, listen up, attention, all street team, all street team, <clears throat> the VIN number for my 63 ragtop, which I want to find this car and buy it back the VIN number. And if you buy it just to sell it back to me, not cool. Um, the VIN number for this car is 521-5507. 521-5507 is the VIN number. Did you look that up to see if it corresponds with the 63? 63 rags up. I did, bro. Okay. Two steps ahead, dude. Two steps ahead. But yeah. Let's say the number again. It's 521-5507. 521-5507, guys. That's the VIN let's number. find it. Find it. So let's find it. There was a couple people that worked for insurance companies, stuff like that, and said, if you can get me the VIN number, I can track the car down. Hopefully so, they're listening. I'm thinking, I'd like to imagine what happened to that car. The story of that car is it was polar silver. It was, it was actually for the times in the nineties, it was super nice. I just finished it. The interior was nice. It was redone like stock, but the interior tweed. was okay. No. For, what was wrong with it? For the nine. What no, was wrong with it? there's nothing wrong with it. Oh, you're going to say, cause it was a VW logo in the door panel. Mm -hmm. Who cares, bro? Mm -hmm. You and your rules. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> you're so stupid. And so is this a VW? I would never know from the iconic shape. <laughs> yeah. So could any, you put a couple more logos inside the car, please? At any rate, um, this car, peeve, this guys. car, this car for the, for the time that this car was built, this car was super nice. That thing on another set of rims would have been sick. No, phone dolls are what made it. Bro, phone dolls are what made that. She car ruined it. With that squirrel intact, ruined it. Come on. I will not let that go over me. <laughs> she ruined it with that blue color she put on it. It looked stupid when Back she was done up. with it. So when I so I sold the car because I blew the engine up. Mm -hmm. First time I had the car out, 2276, super flow heads, 48 IDAs, banging. It wasn't the first time I had Did the car. Did you even have a sump on it? No, bro. I ain't got time for sumps, bro. Go. Don't stop me with the I nonsense, I wonder why bro. it froze up. It's not even that. I over-revved at Racing Gym in front of the shop and locked it up, and I was like, I'm done with Volkswagens. I sold that car in 1993 for 1996. I think I sold it. it 3,500 bucks. Now think about that. Forward disc brakes. No engine in the painted car. Painted rag top. No engine in the car. 3,500 bucks. Let's see. Full interior. The chassis was done, done. Mm -hmm. Like that was a pan off or no? Yeah. Yeah. So it was a pretty clean car. That was ridiculous. I sold my square back for $7,500 though. Bro. What are we doing? Don't try to muddle the story I'm making about you. It's about me. I'm Listen. just saying the prices. My, but think about that. For back in those days, thirty five hundred dollars for a car with no engine. That was a good. That was a good. Probably I mean, was a lot of money. That's a lot of money for a Volkswagen. But but it was also a pretty nice VW. When she then bought the car disappeared. Then the car disappeared. And did the, you sell it to Squirrel? Uh, yeah, she bought it, and then she had the car painted like 
a teal blue pearl and put over squirrel it. in the license and plate. Put squirrel squirrel in the license plate and it was which is the most fitting license plate I could ever think for a car that you potentially own. Yeah. So that so, <laughs> so, so that car, she ended up selling it and she sold it to the guy that worked at the body shop down the street from Justin. Cause I remember it was parked out in front of that body shop one day. I was like, Oh dude, my old rag top is down the street. And at the time it was still teal. It had, you didn't go talk they, to somebody. No, bro. This is a long time. This is like when I was past, I wasn't, I didn't have, I wasn't reminiscing like my son needs to drive that car. So the rebirth can rebirth and rebirth. And so I saw it down there and Justin and I started talking and he's like, yeah, that one guy used to have it down the street. But I do have one picture. There's no plate number on it. And the license plate is on the front bumper, but it's wrapped around the bumper. Like he ran over a curb back and forth. So mm-hmm. really taking care of the car. Nice I'm sure car. it needs new front and rear It clips. would need everything. I can guarantee it. But I'd love to find this car. Four-wheel disc brakes, billet, factory-style billet knobs that were like, there was a company that was making those billet knobs at one time. Mm-hmm. And then um, phone dials, of course. And the reason I did the phone dials was because with the with the drop spindles it added like half an inch to each side of the track and i wanted the wheels to sit in and so i did the 924s phone dials in the front and very positive up 928 16 it so first to do staggered 15s and 16s man first cutting edge you know what you but you know where i got the idea from that huh from the the Plymouth Prowler, it came with 18s and 22s on it from the factory, and I said, "Oh, that's cool, man!" And then because I was trying to figure out how to get the offset, and then I wanted that rake look, but I didn't want big balloon tires, so I did 16 sevens in the rear, 15 sixes in the front, and <clears throat> it kind of worked. It worked out like magic because um, if you're not paying attention, phone phone dials. There's two different styles. There's the ones with the puckered phone dial holes, and the ones like a flat face dish. So. Anyway, that car was uh, super legit. Let's find it, guys. Let's find this car. Let's get that number one more time. The VIN number for this car, the winning number is. So you guys go play Lotto. Five one. Somebody go play Lotto. or uh, Five, five. What is it? I'm looking it up, bro. Hang on. Calm oh, down. I close on, my man. page, bro. Close. So the winning number for your Lotto playing is the VIN number for my 63 Ragtop, which is 521-5507. 521-5507. So, and if you win that billion dollars on that, give us a cut. <laughs> Yeah, bro. Yeah, you're lucky that I gave you that number. That's a lucky number. So, anyway, uh, lots of other stuff happening. We talked about Kelly Park. We're trying to make it to Kelly Park. I think we're going to road trip from here to Kelly Park. So, any of you guys in Arizona that are man enough to meet us here in Vegas and follow us up there, and then we all drive in caravan together. We got to get a caravan at some point with somebody other than just me and George, bro. It's good. We got to have a crew here. More we people. No, we need to. We just did a Grand House Road Show with four of us. And buses. Mm-hmm. That was pretty. That was pretty donkey donk, dude. Mm-hmm. The double cab just humming down the road. My it stereo system, bro. <laughs> bro, that stereo sounds good in the car. So, anyway, uh, update on the Type Thirty Four. As you guys are seeing, that Andy's uh, working away at it. I'm going to be putting some more videos out. He sent me a few dozen pictures of what's been happening for it. And as of today, Friday, well. Thursday here, Friday, when, when you're listening to this. As of today, the last thing that was done is John Brewster, who's podcast alumni, John Brewster, who did uh, some JB racing and JB fabrication. He is doing some of the metal work on the lower front apron, mm-hmm. and he's making a couple other metal pieces, and it won't be until the end of next week when the rest of the lower rocker pieces come in play. But uh, And Andy's going to paint the inside of the rear apron before he welds that piece on. So he said, we are going blue, right? I said, yes, it's going to be a blue, a color blue. So <clears throat> the, isn't what, what color is that now? Gulf blue, sea blue. What is it? It's sea blue right now. Are you going back to that color or no? Uh, I don't know, bro. I'm going to get a little jiggy with it, dude. A little jiggy with it. So and you guys, sauce on it. and you guys haven't seen the custom wheels and you guys haven't seen the custom interior. So I'm excited for Who's that doing your wheels? Is it, I, I just saw, started following someone on Instagram that's in the UK that you can order hoops and stuff from. Is that the guy doing them? The, 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 my wheels were made by a company called Rims Incarnated. Rims, I think that's it. Rims yep. Incarnated. So they made Because you the and Andy both followed them. Correct. Because now I'd like to get in touch with this guy because he mm-hmm. says he can do the one-piece hoops for BBS wheels. Mine is a one-piece hoop, and I want to change my offset because I have an inch and five-eight spacer. 
I'd like to eliminate and put that inch and five eighths on outside lip. Just draw what you want on a piece of paper. Send it to Andy. He'll call. The, he'll, he'll ring up the chaps over there and they'll get right to it. Ten four. Just tell Andy what you want. Draw it on a piece of paper. Send it over there. A little sketchy, Handle. skiddy sketch. Yeah. So I got a custom set of wheels made over there for a really good price. And uh, wait to see these custom wheels because your boy Bill T doing four lug, bro. I ain't playing games. <laughs> I play for keeps, dude. <laughs> George lives his life with a bunch of nonsense rules. Four and one thirty. <sighs> Loving it, dude. Loving it. <sighs> yeah. You're just jealous, dude. You're just jealous. So um anything else in the scene that we need to discuss? Anything shout out to Adam Powell. He got a square back going recently. That thing's killer looking. That's the one that was being pushed on. He was being uh, pushed because he's retarded on, and he left something loose on it. But besides his little ground stro or his uh Cable in the back of the starter coming loose. That thing is sick looking. Yeah, come on. Good Adam. work, Adam. Adam, get it together, bro. Him and his brother Brandon did that. Don't get your car I'm sure pushed. with some help from some other heads out there in Arizona, but don't get they your did car nice pushed on, on the internet. Don't get it pushed on the internet. So speaking of that, we're talking about You're internet. just reinforcing stereotypes, Adam. No. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of, <clears throat> speaking of that, we were talking about the internet, Instagram, all that fun kind of stuff. And I have been getting so there's people out there that are like their goal is to try to get tons and tons of followers. And I'm not sure why I obviously want followers. So more people can listen to the podcast and enjoy the content that we create. Some other people just want followers. I don't know if like a what, number, but, or they, they want to try to, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, but I tell you this, I get some people that I followed and then they start posting so much stuff and it's not even, it's just like regular stuff. Like, mm -hmm. Nothing exciting, and I'm like... Day-to-day -day mundane stuff. No, just like, yeah, just like... Not monumental moments, or hey, check this out, <sighs> this is pretty awesome and, and original. And I wonder to it's myself... It's just like, check out my toast. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, a, there, there's a guy... If you post food too much, I unfollow you immediately. There, there, there's, a guy, there's a guy in the UK, his Instagram handle is Black Bugs with a Z, mm -hmm. and he's got like 100,000 followers, and all it is is reels of the same car. And I'm thinking, that's so crazy that that many people are like digging these reels and I'm watching the reels and I'm just thinking like, this is insanity, but his reels getting tons of likes, all stuff. And I just thought like, do I just do that with the chop top all day to get a, a bunch of reels? But then maybe people just like, like watching them. Maybe he just puts out entertaining reels and stuff. I've seen a few of yeah. them. And, uh, I, and so speaking about Instagram, like I like people that are putting up cool content, people mm -hmm. that are putting up something different, following a build, doing something but when people are just like like you can tell like i got to get my two posts a day like i post once a week and i could be much better at social media marketing but it's not how i feed my family like it's yeah like and i don't want it to be how i feed my family where it becomes like a job and i gotta grind it out all the time just because i like that it's something i enjoy doing and i'm giving back to the hobby but i don't understand well first what i want to say is if you're doing all that stuff, posting over and over, and it's just like, like so the guys there's no variety. Like the guys tightening up a wheel. This is a, this is a and it's like a trick reel. It's like 15 seconds of something, and then you're like looking at it. It says something like, when you blah 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 blah, and you're like, wait, pause. And it let shows me look you at a the blip. blip. And, and, it, and, well, it. What it, and what it you is, you got to watch the damn thing again. Well, like, what is this? Garbage? And those are some of the those are some of the tricks where it's like, yeah, yeah look how many views I got because people are like, well, what is this? Well, I got, I got then, a reel that got 16,000 views, and it was a five. Or maybe even four seconds of Dunkel's bus coming down the road. Yeah. Well, that's and because it's, it's, it's quick. Four seconds and people are watching. Exactly. Over so someone over. was there and watching like, did I miss something? What is it. that? Yeah. So that's the trick, right? I'm going to put I just out. had a long one hit 20,000. So the long one. The biggest, the biggest uh, real exposure I got. And I only have 5,000 followers. I haven't paid for a follower yet. I think some people pay for followers. Um, but. Uh, uh, well, I know people pay for followers because you can. That's you, our own you, prerogative. That ain't our own battle to fight. You, I'm not fighting a battle. I'm making a statement. I'm analyzing a situation, making a statement. So my point is, people pay for followers so they can put out a perception that they have tons and tons of people. But when you look at the followers' likes compared to followers, and you look at that ratio, it's way, 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 way off. Versus like if you see people that have the same amount of followers, but have a much higher like ratio. There's more engagement in their content, the people. So it's interesting. And the, the algorithm changes on it quite a bit. And for me, it's well now what I love to get a paycheck for doing the podcast. I wouldn't be mad, but it's not something that I'm actively <clears throat> pursuing. Yeah. I mean, I do it cause I, love I don't the, expect I, to get paid I from the YouTube. hobby. 
Well, I need to get paid for my. This, I'm like Martin Scorsese, bro. I'm well, putting out creations. You you wouldn't be 200. How many episodes? Who? 260. You wouldn't be 260 episodes if you're looking to get paid from this because you haven't been paid yet from it. Well, I mean, so, it, technically, I have the listeners support by buying some merch yeah. and some stuff like that. I'm just saying it's not. Uh, could you quit your job tomorrow and feed no, your family no, no, off no, of this? No, no, no. 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 You it guys pays. can split a snicker next week. <laughs> well, you know, we split a snicker with a fork and knife like George Costanza. But what we what, what it does is the shirt sales pay for the podcasting and to buy more shirts to sell more shirts. I remember a commercial like this in the 80s. (laughs) I do more drugs so that I I can work longer. I can make more money so I can buy more Coke. Yeah. So I I don't think we're talking about Coca Cola. So I can (laughs) do more drugs so I can can work longer. Yeah. So, um, but my. You have a passion for this? I got a passion for my thing. But my point, here's, here's my point I brought up. If you're out there desperately, like you're just putting out like a video of your, like, just like a, the 50th video of the back of your car driving or whatever the case is. And it's the same. It's really, I just stopped following because it's like, what am I looking at here? It's like this, this guy, this guy's put 50 of these same videos on there and it's kind of boring. Like put out some content and there's, <clears throat> there's an algorithm, right? Like two posts, two to four posts a day will garner so many followers. And I notice when I put more posts, I get more followers. But I'd rather have people follow me because they genuinely enjoy the content and they Correct. want to keep up with what's going on versus people that are following just because like, oh, yeah, I'll follow or follow for follower and that kind of stuff. But I think it's a platform for people to be creative. And there's a lot of people that are on here that are pretty creative. And I, I definitely like that. We may start a segment <clears throat> that we might do in the next round table where you're going to have to give me five instagram people you you follow that you like like uh the one guy that i follow is um phoenix fabrication and this guy this guy is uh he's pretty funny he um he just has this whole way that he does everything and it's it, it's it's pretty interesting the guy who starts hasty suckers or whatever <laughs> i'm trying to find i'm trying to find his page so i can share it because I don't know. I don't know if there's something wrong with me, or there's what. definitely something wrong with you. You guys <coughs> that intro has been trying to play all day episode <laughs> because this is how this guy starts his podcasts all the time, and it's pretty funny. Let me see. Is it actually a curse word? No. Well, let me see. Dead silence. Riveting podcasting taking place right well, now. Well, this is when you're supposed to jump in, George. Just about to wrap it. All right, let's see here. Let me see if I can. Oh, hey, hey. Oh. <laughs> Gerald, what's up, dickheads? It's only got 90 seconds. We'll make this short and sweet. <laughs> All right. Yeah. He cracks me up, bro. So the guy's Mike Mike Fabry, and uh, it's Phoenix Fabricate, Fabrications with a Z, because you know that's how they do it. Um, but he's pretty funny. He's a he's a guy, years in, putting he's in, a guy in Florida. That does a bunch of donks, and he used to work on. Uh, he used to work on a bunch of uh, BMWs. <laughs> Another one, Johnny Hamcheck is pretty, is pretty funny. Um, but uh, yeah, there's lots, lots to go with that stuff. So we're gonna come up with that. Maybe some of the people that we're following, some people like Annie Annie VW. So she's got a cool little page where she's doing some stuff. And then I sort of follow Phoenix Fabrication because he just cracks me up with his with his posts, and he just shows a bunch of fabrication work that other people do. And then he's it's just too funny, man. It's it's a good time. So I like. I mean, I watch stuff because it cracks me up, you know. So anything that makes me laugh, I like it, bro. I have a price, and it's one giggle. There's a dude I like that I think it's Dave's Auto Repair or Dave's. Um, it's oh, an older yeah. dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Older guy, but he goes through. They just did a. Um, they just talk about like he shows problems <clears throat> and what they do for the solutions and like just such like that looks like a shop that you would just love to be a mechanic in. Yeah. Because not only do they have all the right equipment. Yeah, I saw what he was doing. The shop looks beautiful. He was doing like, an intake manifold on a Dodge Eco Diesel that was all mucked up from the ERG Yeah, they do the uh, walnut blasting. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So while it's in the car. Yeah. Which is nuts. Well, speaking of that kind of stuff, I was looking at, uh, I, I watch, I watch this one obsessed garage and it's kind of back and forth. Like the guy, the guy on, it's just a, a little, he's a little different cat, but, uh, he, he does, uh, 
he's big into car detailing, all that stuff. And so I started going down a rabbit hole with that. And they had ice blasting on there. And mm-hmm. if you've seen that dry, dry ice, ice blasting, blasting yeah. like when I saw it, I liked it so much, I started putting time in like, I'm going to buy an ice blasting oh. unit and maybe start a business with that. Like, that's what I thought. Yeah. I'll invest $20,000, I thought, and start an ice blasting business. Like, no. Like, to get a legit Because you also commercial. have to make, like, no. I, there, Tavarsh, you know, Tavarsh is mm-hmm. on, in, on YouTube. Yeah. So he just did an episode where they were talking to the guy that does their ice blasting. And he manufactures his own dry ice. You can't. But here you just get it from like a beverage yeah. a beverage place here in town. You wouldn't manufacture. That's a whole that's a whole other deal. But the cool thing about the dry ice blasting is like you can set the you can set it to where there's no media to pick up because it just yeah. vaporizes once the ice hits it hard enough, which is pretty ingenious. The problem is even at the SEMA show, I tried to find first, this is a message to all you ice blast sales guys. You're not very friendly, first. Second, um, most of them were German and didn't speak any English that were there at the SEMA show. And I was trying to get some information on it, but it, it wasn't something serious enough because every time I saw a unit, it was so small, I thought. Yeah, what do I do with that? Yeah, I'm going to spend most of my time shoveling, filling the thing full of uh, ice. So, But I saw that technology. I thought it was super cool. Um, and I tried to look into it, and it just seemed too that cost laser blasting one looks dope. The one that takes off the rust? Yeah, that's insane. Yeah, well, if if you go down a, if you go down a, a, the rabbit hole of doing that stuff, I was also looking at because I have I, I had an SBG crank that I kept when I sold the Gia to you that came in the in, in the mm-hmm. Gia, and that SBG crank I had forever, and then one time it came back from the swap meet, left in a crate on the side of the house, and the crates got rained on, and then water no. got inside the crate, and then this SBG crank got all kinds of. I don't want to say flash rust because it seems to be a little bit more than that because it sat in there for months with just water beating up on it. So it was kind of frustrating. And so I started looking at rust removal because we did that um, evapo rust that we mm-hmm. bought, which works really great to take rust off of stuff. Um, but I was started thinking like, what can I do for this? And then there's an electrolysis process that you follow using a battery charger, some electrodes you put in the water. And you can look mm-hmm. it up on YouTube. There's a bunch of different... I saw a girl that get, was restoring her VW do that to her fenders. Yeah, to get like she put them in a big uh, like a kiddie off of pool, stuff like that. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> so there's some there's some cool stuff to do. I mean, and again, we're back to if we're talking about show cars, it's like you don't have to have big money to do anything. You just have to have time and energy to do it. You know. You know, I've I've been seeing like I saw that post that Annie put up, and I've just been thinking about this: how people like they want to discredit a shop because it's a shop. The only difference between a shop. And the regular average Joe is the is the fact that that person decided to put their focus, time, and energy into learning that skill set, and it became their profession. But they're still a human being. They're not. They don't have any magical powers. They just have the patience and the persistence to get it done. And at this point, now it's become their profession. So, my first car that I built. Yeah. Was it built by a professional? No, because I wasn't a professional. I worked at a VW shop, but I was only there for a couple months no, when you, I was I did that. I wasn't, you were like a, wasn't a professional. Yeah. yeah. You're like so a like anybody, if they put time and effort into it, can build it, you know? No, there's no question about that. I mean, that's... that's but to discredit pro- shops, it annoys me. Well, I don't think it's because so much Because it's a that. shop that did it. When there's you people see, in that shop. When you, see, when you see the complaints, it's like, oh, yeah, anybody can build something. And if they don't drive it, it's not worth it. And if they don't. And so all these people live by. It sounds like somebody I know this dude named George. Have all these rules they got to live by. Rules. And, it's like, <laughs> and, it, and it's like the reality is people can do whatever they want with their cars. Now, is it a shame for somebody to spend tons and tons of money in a car and never enjoy it? I believe that's a shame. Mm-hmm. Look, look at look at our boy Kramer up there in the UK with the FUBAR 64. Yeah. The car's never been started, I don't think. Yeah, no, it's never had a one in the engine. And, you, I and, saw him put some posts about him, that. But for him, for him, it's like there it was a it was a challenge and a and, but that guy built it out of his garage. Yep. You know? And that's nicer than ninety five percent of the show cars out there done by shops. Oh, that that car is unbelievable. But yeah, again, the level of detail is insane on that know, thing. You know, that guy's got a bag of meth, a lot of free time. No, but, yeah, but, but the whole Lyndon, thing about that no, also Lyndon's, is he, Lyndon's cool. He's but you it, don't get to enjoy it. Why do? Why are you even building it? If you well, don't, I, I mean, but he, it, again, you know, he enjoys it in his own way. Like for him, enjoyment is to see it. But look at the quicksand bus that I built. When I moved that thing from the from the show back to Celebrity Cars, I think it had 136 miles on it or something like that. Yeah, is all that car is done in the three years it's been built? That's stupid. Yeah, you know. 
No, I, listen. I mean, it's it's all, it's all. I mean, when it's all said and done, it's somebody else's car. They can do yeah. what they want with it, whether they want to tow it or drive it or do whatever. It's a bummer when you put that kind of effort into something and and <clears throat> no one ever reaps the rewards of it. I mean, besides magazine features, all that goofiness, like. Well, it's like when grandma used to buy the couches and put the clear vinyl. Yeah. The clear vinyl say, covers who are you everything. saving it for? Right. Who are like I I I just had an argument with the owner the other day because he called me like, hey, I'm gonna pull out of there, take the show next week. Do you look at it? I'm like, yeah, get it to me. I'll look at it. You know, I'm like, what are? Why does it just sit somewhere? Right. Why aren't you out? Why aren't you out there putting scratches on it? Mm-hmm. If you're so worried about it, I'm with you. You know, just enjoy the dang thing. It's a real yeah. bummer. Now, listen, Look I, mean, at, uh, I mean, to each their own, everybody's got their, their own deal in the hobby. I just think there's when a lot of people are blasting cars that win or ripping on a show. And, you know, Andy's post was like he was upset because a bunch of people were talking a bunch of trash about Volks World only does this. They only invite this and it's got all these things. <clears throat> and then come when it came down to it, they don't even support the show. Yeah. And it's there. like when when you are in the hobby and you cry about there's not enough events and then you don't go to events, yeah. you're the problem. Yep. You are the reason that those things are happening. So stand up straight, look in the mirror and take your ownership that you're the problem. I am my own problem. But yeah, it, it's it's always been interesting because I've had cars. The the bull run bus I built mm-hmm. first show out. I got first place. I got everything I wanted. Nothing. Mm-hmm. And the Type Thirty Four Gia Buddy built. Mm-hmm. And the Gia ten times nicer. And but it was just it was just a different it was a different experience. You don't have the same Gia. bond to a car and like the bull run bus because you. Andrew was a baby when he like he was a young young kid. Well, there may you on be that. some sentimental value to it, but there's like building a car, and you get a, a level of appreciation out of it. For me, it's uh, you know, I just have a I just have a problem with cars. It's like well, well my point well, I was going to make there is you have a connection to that car because you put time and effort into that car. Yeah, but there's very cars, differently no, than the Gia. But there's cars you built for the Vansons that they, mm-hmm. that was his dad's car. So yep. he didn't do anything. He, he you did all the stuff, but that car has sentimental value to him. So Correct. I think I think the the whole reason that my motivation for building the Type 34 Gia having it built doing all that stuff, the motivation behind that was the inspiration I received from seeing a Randy Gates car. That was the reason I thought that car is freaking dope. How can you have a car that's just such a standout in a crowd? And I want to build something that's cool. And I know I can't build it. And I want something super different. So what could I get that's more different than this? How about a Type 34 Gia? And then that's where that whole thing spurred from. And then to build it was kind of like there was kind of this mission to build it. And then once it got built, it was done. And then I thought, oh, I'll throw it up for sale and see if somebody. I mean, I usually don't sell cars. And I was like, I'll throw it up for sale. I had a buyer. I sold it. it. It is what it is. Now I'm building another one because I like those cars so much. <clears throat> and I want to do something cool and unique on this one. And I just want to have another Type 34 because I like it. I'm excited to get on the road with the Gia TC. But that, you know, that can, it's not a, a high priority. But it's a cool, it's a cool little car. And uh, we got a motor for the Gia TC already at the shop. A NATO motor. It is a, uh, a howitzer, howitzer howitzer motor that mm-hmm. is used when you're transporting it over terrain. Right. It'll move at about three kilometers an hour. 16. 16? 16 kilometers an hour. It'll keep the speed at the 16 kilometers an hour and the motor's designed to run the hydraulic system in the howitzer. Okay. So it's 24 it, volts all over. It's got a 24 volt alternator, chokes, and idle cutoff circuits. So we fired up on my stand with 12 volts, but it would not stay idling because the idle cutoff circuits were not opening up. So we're going to switch some of those parts out to 12 volt and get a 12 volt charging system on it. And we're going to drop a pancake. It's going to be a brand new pancake 1.8 liter type, 4. Leader type yeah. 4 dropped in the back of the thing. Never open the deck lid again and just drive it. That's type four. Driving and crying, bro. What do you mean type four? You never know about that one. You're just such a crackhead, bro. You you have a brother that has a type four, the the bull run bus, a motor that's in the carbon cab now. It's been going for 20 some years. So why don't you know where where do you get this idea from? This crack. Yeah, but it's stock. There's a big difference between Jake Raby built and a stock. No, I don't think so. 
I think there's a big difference. I think the biggest issue with type fours was the way people were driving them. That to me is the number one issue. You put a little tiny motor in a big heavy bus and people will be driving them out here in the hot desert, lugging the motors. I mean, those motors love to be driven at 4,000 RPM. That's the RPM for the VW motors, the 4,000 RPM. 4,000, close enough, bro. So why are you splitting hairs at me? What's the American cars, what's a V8 car run out on the highway? 15, 17? No, 2,000 RPM. About 2,000 RPM on the highway. That's where they're at. So you're talking it, it to the average person that's not used to driving a Volkswagen, and then they get into a, a Volkswagen from a V8, they're on the freeway, and they're thinking, I mean, you drive a stock bus, dude. Like, those gear, ring and pinners are geared so high. I mean, you're pushing. It's uncomfortable to drive a car at 3,700 RPM, I mean, especially to me, too. But I think what happens is, People are so used to under lugging those motors or lugging them, driving them in low RPM. That's why you had so much issue with that because it's not like they had this huge systematic failure of all the type fours. I think another issue would be the fact like that's early gen fuel injection and there were problems with it. And if there were problems with it that were not corrected immediately because they all, always had a problem with the boot that goes from that Bosch air sensor to the manifold. And once there's any sort of intake leak in that boot, it's getting unmetered air coming through it. And I think they had a lot of lean lean conditions because of poor well, yeah, induction it's, it's, system. Well, it's just it's just lack of maintenance and operator yeah. because people were so used to buying a beetle, never, never opening it. up the yeah. deck lid and driving it forever. And they just got used to things being so reliable. And then when you start getting heavier, more horsepower, all that kind of stuff. It just has a tendency to be there because Volkswagen did not have a reputation of unreliable vehicles at all. Mm -mm. Secondhand market is a different conversation, bro, yeah. because everybody had the courage to work on something. So that's a game changer. Well, this is what I talk about when cars come in. Like, uh, you never know who has touched the car before you when they come into my shop. And that is really going to determine how much you're going to spend on your car to get it mechanically sound. If you had somebody that actually knew what they were doing that maintained it, there's a good chance that it's not going to be super expensive to get that car back on the road. If you have a crap box that has good exterior and it looks good and everything underneath it is an absolute train wreck, then it's going to be a pretty expensive project to get that thing back to what I would call a standard reliable VW. Yeah, no, I, I agree. There's a, there is a, uh, there's a lot of too much DIY in our industry. Well, and unfortunately, DIY wrong. That's 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 the main problem. We get so many people that DIY it, but don't do it with any knowledge. They don't look into it. They don't. They don't even crack open a book. You know. <laughs> yeah. No, there's uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of people that are hands on and should be hands off. So yeah, you get your hands off your car. Yeah, you you never know. But at any rate, um, anything else, George? You wanted to chat about this. Uh, this podcast because thank you to my 1500 and i think 26 now subscribers i appreciate every one of you we will have a video coming out this week and we are doing the uh, carb sinking video i promised it just took a lot longer to film than expected and even that right now i'm going through the editing process bit of a train wreck <laughs> well it's, uh, it, it's always a lot of work to just to be consistent put those put those videos out and have stuff that uh that you're feeling good enough to put out there for all, for all the people to see. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's uh listen, I don't, I don't want to, I don't mean to brag, but uh, thanks to my 1400 subscribers and uh, appreciate you guys for uh, following my YouTube channel. So check out the YouTube channel. We've got more, we got, we'll have another video up coming out next week for the um, Zorba, Zorba, <laughs> Zorba second uh, stage two. And after that, we'll be starting the series on the GTB bug. So I'm going to do a little history. I may do just a separate podcast on some MP history. I've been trying to get uh, Danny Zepeda on here. We had a phone conversation for probably like 45 minutes about a lot of the history with uh, MP and one of the guys that he knew and the whole story of how he ended up with all the original MP artwork, which is a really cool story. So I'll be bringing that to the public here shortly. And uh, next week, I've got uh, Rick Mortensen coming on the podcast. So I'm looking forward to that. If you like that podcast, and I'm sure you did, make sure you share this podcast with your friends. Whatever platform you listen to on, copy it, paste it, send it in a group chat to all your VW enthusiasts. And if you want to support the podcast, go to letstalkdubs.com, click on the store, 
and buy some merch. Support your boy. Also, don't forget, reserve your rooms for one crazy weekend. Go to letstalkdubs.com. Click on the link. It'll take you to the Orleans Hotel and Casino page. And get yourselves some funky, fresh room set up for one crazy weekend. It's going to be a great time. Don't miss it. It's going to be even crazier this year. So until next week, guys, later. You probably don't know that there's a new Volkswagen out that doesn't look like a Volkswagen. Volkswagen.